Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. A little bit more brighter and optimistic this week because Spurs got back to kind of doing their job pretty well on the whole at the weekend. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time in this video talking about the Sheffield United match, but just some kind of key points that obviously we, we have to discuss, especially a certain French midfielder. But uh, now it's better. It was better. You know, it was more of the aggressive pressing and enthusiasm and players just doing their job that we really want to see. Um, it was an interesting one. We obviously made the trip up to Sheffield. It was a bit of a chilly day at Bramall Lane. Um, stood outside the stadium just to begin with, just to see, because I could see the coaches were coming in not long after I parked up. So had a little look and, and obviously you have that moment where you're working out oh, who's, who's coming off, who hasn't come off and... Uh, Obviously, not seeing Deli Alley, which sadly, I think is the bit saddest thing of it all, is probably not the shock it used to be. I think we're now kind of, it's almost more of a surprise when he's there, which is, is such a shame. But we'll come to Delhi later. So yeah, once inside the stadium, I find it kind of interesting. I haven't seen him do this before, maybe once. Um, Jose Mourinho, before kickoff, was just prowling up and down the width of the middle of the pitch um just kind of almost by the center line going along it but not quite he was looking occasionally at the players warming up uh looking sometimes at the Sheffield United players warming up but mostly just looking down at the turf walking up and down totally sub, you know consumed by his thoughts um he was masked up but he was just wearing a jumper on it like I said very cold day up in Sheffield and I just thought it was really interesting. Just kind of this kind of moment where this, you know, one of the most successful managers in the game, just whether he was thinking through what he was going to say to the players before the match, whether he was thinking through last minute tactical adjustments because of having seen the Sheffield United lineup, or whether he was just wondering what he was going to have for dinner that day. I don't know, but I just thought it was really interesting. Just sometimes. And this is the cool thing, as you know, as I've always said, very privileged to be able to go into matches and stadiums right now while, you know, you guys can't, which, you know, we need you back. Honestly, it's still so soulless. Um, but the privilege, the lucky thing of being in is just to see little things like that. I just found it fascinating just to see this guy totally alone in his thoughts. No coaches talking to him, no players talking to him. You know, he could have done that in a room somewhere in the stadium, but he, he just chose to do it straight in the centre of that pitch almost, walking up and down. And just, yeah, it's weird little things that I find fascinating. So the team he picked itself, we went from four central midfielders um, against Fulham, which did feel very negative, to five defenders at Sheffield United, which on the face of it, you could probably look at that and think it's negative, but actually kind of had the reverse effect. Um, mostly it's because of those fullbacks. It unshackled um, Aurier and Regulon just that little bit more to uh, to kind of really kind of almost become wingers. There were times when it became a back five, don't get me wrong, but on the whole, there was a nicer balance to it all. And, you know, you saw Regulon frequently bombing on up the pitch, knowing that he had, um, who do you have? Uh, Dyer, Roden, oh Davies, of course it was Ben Davies was able to come across and cover behind him uh, so you saw Regulon bombing on and sometimes even swapping with Son and he was actually the three on the left of the front three Regulon at times just for a little spell until he swapped back with Son but I thought that really kind of gave Spurs an impetus up the left and then I think you saw, well you did see on the right Serge Aurier then had the licence to get forward and scored a goal from a corner as well um, so yeah, it, was, it was much, much better. Um, the pressing in particular, you know, you've probably, if you've watched these before, you've heard me say it in the past, my favourite Tottenham Hotspur is the aggressive, aggressive pressing Tottenham Hotspur. Under Poch, that was their best version. And I feel like under Mourinho, it, they're tailored to be able to do it. They're fit players. And I feel with Hoybier as well, when you push him just into that kind of mopping up area just inside the opposition half. I think that's when he really excels. And you saw it led to Kane's goal, you know. Son, some really... If you watch that back, watch Son's tracking back. It's superb as well. He puts the pressure on, forces the player on the right, whose name has escaped me, inside. He then runs into, essentially, Hoybier, who intercepts his attempt to get the ball away, plays in Kane. Kane does what he does best, just rifle a shot low down after a little bit of a run. So, yeah, much, much, much better. And it, um, I thought it was a really interesting quote from Kane afterwards, um, who said, 
You know, it's never been the manager saying that, as in us to sit back. Uh, it's just something that we on the pitch, there's something about our mentality where we're wanting to sit back and try and hold on to leads during games. Uh, and I thought that was quite interesting. You know, obviously, some could say it's just Kane being the good student, uh, you know, bringing an apple for the teacher and, and just saying the right things. But, you know, I think, as I said in the last video, I think Mourinho, for me, I wasn't too keen on the team selection. I felt that having, you know, Sissoko as well as Winks and Hoybier lent itself to Tottenham naturally pulling back. But what I would say, and I think I've said it as well, is, is a lot of it has to go on the players as well. I've got some comments after the last video saying how horrible I was being towards Mourinho. It's not that. It was more his selection for me I wasn't too fond of. Um, and, you know, as I always say, who am I to criticise a manager that's won 25 trophies in 20 years or so? But I just felt the selection at home against Fulham, a team in the bottom three, wasn't necessary. Um, but then, again, I feel... Credits due for Mourinho for the way he set up the team at Sheffield United. I think a lot of people may have seen that and thought, you're going to the league's bottom team. What are you doing? But actually, having three at the back rather than four gave Spurs that extra attacking impetus. And, you know, they had other chances. You know, Son hit the post. Uh, Kane smashed a couple of shots over. that They could have won that even more comfortably. Um, but, yeah, no credit to him. And, and you know... I think you have to look at three defeats in just just three defeats in 30 games in all competitions. I must admit, I didn't realise it was that many games. It's incredible, as in 30 games. That is, that's impressive. That really is. Yes, of course, there's too many draws in there. Mourinho knows that himself. The players know that. And you can do, always do the what-if game of, you know, if they hadn't drawn them, where they'd be in the league table, which is a ridiculous league table. You look at the results, you know, Chelsea were ahead of Spurs, and now they've absolutely dropped like a stone behind Spurs and have played an extra game. That's what this table is doing. Mourinho, to be fair to him, called it a few weeks back. He said, two wins, bang, you're up there. Two defeats, you can find yourself in the bottom half. It's such a weird, weird season. Um, and obviously, there's various things, missing players, stuff like that, all plays its part. Um, players isolating, the nature of the fixtures coming so thick and fast, but it's weird really weird um but yeah 2021 started well unbeaten in 2021 won four out of the five games so yes i still believe that spurs and Mourinho need to find the balance in the team um there was a better balance on sunday but you can't argue in terms of the actual um you know those those figures though they are very good figures and it shows some kind of consistency within like i say that mad's this mad season where consistency has been so hard for so many teams. So if Spurs can keep those foundations and build on it, you know, I think that's, that's all it is. That's all it is. And it's exactly what I said right at the end of the last video. It's about Mourinho unlocking the squad he's got and just finding that perfect balance. Um, and I, and I think he, I think he's, he will. I do. I genuinely, I, be, I do believe in him and as a manager who's able to get the best out of a squad. Uh, you can argue about his techniques, you can argue about his team selection sometimes, but you can't really argue at what he does with teams and, and the results he gets. So let's talk about Tongi Ondembele. Um A moment for Tongi, as it were. Um, you know, if you've watched my videos, you read my stuff, you know what a huge fan I am of Tongi Ondembele. And I just felt Sunday was the culmination of everything. Everything that he's been working towards himself everything Mourinho has been working with him towards and everything I think we hoped he could be. It was beautiful. It was beautiful, yet businessman-like. It's really weird. I think that is, for me, the biggest credit that can go to Underbelly and Mourinho is that he hasn't lost any of the, what I call, beautiful impudence of his play, the just instinctive, born-with-it creativity while adding on the workmanlike abilities of other players. I mean, here's something for you. And this for this for any Ondembele critics. Ondembele ran more on Sunday, further, than any other Spurs player. 10.94 kilometres he ran. So that's more than the likes of Hoybier. That's more than those wing-backs going up and down the pitch. So Ondembele managed to produce what he did 
while running that much. You know, it, it was incredible, and it, it, it's so. You know, he's either making you gasp with what he does, or he's making you smile, and that for me is what football is all about. I love it. I absolutely love it. And uh, you know, you just look at everything he was doing, apart from the pressing, the tracking, the no look passes, the pirouettes, the outside of the foot pass to Serge Aurier in the first half, which was sublime. Uh, it was his pass to Son when Son hit the post, um, and then the goal. The goal. <laughs> um, if anyone tries to tell you, and I think Graham Soonis apparently did on Sky. Obviously, I wasn't. I was there, so I wasn't watching the telly. If anyone tells you he didn't mean it, they have not watched Tongi on Dembele closely. It was for everything. You could just see the moment he was starting to drift slightly wide, you knew what he was going to try and do. And even then, it was still shocking in how brilliant it was. Um, Aaron Ramsdale had a pretty ropey game. Um, he wasn't the best, but I, I'd be stunned if any goalkeeper would have expected or got to that shot. That delicate little lob over and into arcing into the bottom right corner and off the post. It was beautiful. Um, Steven Bergwijn deserves props for the build-up, which I'm going to come to in a minute. But this is all about on Dembele. And it just, for me, just said everything. And, you know, he got 90 minutes as well. It was also an answer to the people saying, but he can only last 60, 70 minutes. He got 90 minutes. And in the final stages, he was still running strong. Absolutely. Mourinho was so happy after the game for him. You know, he called his goal genius, but he said, actually... Even if he hadn't scored the goal, for me, it was about the performance. He said that, that was almost like the icing on the cake uh, or the cherry on top of the cake. Uh, he said he did everything, everything I wanted of him, essentially, he did. Um, and he's going to use him as an example. You know, we talk about Delhi, and we will talk about him later. We talk about all these players like Bale as well that can't get into the team. Um Ondembele has absolutely shown the blueprint of how to get back into Mourinho's affections. Um, you know, if it had been down to Mourinho, he probably would have gone. Uh, I don't think there's any getting away from that. He had that meeting with Daniel Levy towards the end of the season, which was very important. But he was just never really the how do you get like the mould of a Mourinho player whatsoever. He was too almost like a luxury player. Um, an absolute credit. You know, Mourinho could not say it enough. He would not take any credit for him, which I thought was pretty cool for a guy who doesn't mind taking a bit of credit. I thought it was really cool. He gave all of the credit. He wouldn't even let Daniel Levy get any credit. Daniel Levy's meeting was quite an important one. But he said, look, that was minimal compared to what the player himself does. And he said the expression he, he used was, I'll, my door is always open for any player to come into my team but they have to walk through that door. I'm not going to go through it and grab them. And you feel that that's kind of a little, maybe a message towards Bale or Delhi or whoever you want to aim that at. And Ondembele did it. And he was phenomenal, honestly. Uh, one of the best performances. He's now got four goals and three assists. So to anyone says that he doesn't impact in the final third, and he'll often find with Ondembele, he also has the pre-assist. He's often the guy that sets up, gets the ball in with a no-look pass, a clever little... Um, you know, This is the thing with Ondembele. We moan about players that lose the ball, and we also moan about players that play safe sideways passes. But those players that take the risks and do lose the ball are often the ones that try those fast, quick passes between the lines. And that's what Ondembele did. And actually, his pass success rate was pretty decent. I think he only... I think it was something like 72 passes, and I think it was only about eight or maybe nine that didn't reach their man out of all of that. Uh, 92 touches the ball. He was involved in everything good that Spurs did. He was phenomenal. But let's move on, because I said I didn't want to talk too much about the match, because I'm aware it was a few days ago now. Um, Joe Roden, I thought he did really well. I thought his was a very composed performance. I thought I asked Mourinho about him after the game. You might have seen his response. It was a little bit mixed, which I think there's a reason behind. You know, I said my question was something like, uh, what did you make of his performance today? He looks quite comfortable at this level. And his uh, reply was, yeah, he did some good things. He also did some not so good things, which uh, he's going to have to learn from and stuff. And I just felt it was a little bit like, oh, really? That was uh, unusual. But then the when he went on, you kind of saw where he was going with it. So he was saying like, you know, some teams can buy a £70 million player uh, or £70 million defender, fix their problem. He goes in and they do it. I think obviously he's looking at someone like Ruben Diaz. Uh, at Man City and then 
he says, and then you've got someone like Joe who can be a very good player, but he has to develop, he has to learn, he has to make mistakes to learn from them. Um, so it's kind of, it's a little bit of a reality check, just letting people know, look, this is how Spurs have to operate right now. These are the kind of players we're going to buy. It's always been the Spurs way. On the whole, we know Ondimbele is exactly the same, a young player that needs to make mistakes, learn and improve. Um, but I think there's a lot of promise in Roden. He's anticipation is pretty good. You know, there was one bit where I think it was Oliver Burke went through, beat Eric Dyer, and Roden kind of came out of nowhere, anticipated really well, showed a little bit of pace, and got there and cut the ball out. Uh, he likes a crunching tackle. He's good in the air. Um, yes, he occasionally gets caught ball watching, um, but that's, again, that's one of those youthful things that will get drummed out of him. You know, he's only 23. I don't think he turned 23 that long ago. Um, there's a lot of promise there. There's a lot of um, player to work with, I suppose is the best way to put it. And, and Mourinho, you know, he has done that. You look at um, Varane at Real Madrid. He very much, he can take a young defender and he can work with them. So I hope Roden gets more chances. Um, I, can, I can understand why some people are a little bit disappointed that Toby Alderweireld finds himself out of the team at the moment. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that's about. Someone suggested to me maybe it's because he's in the red limit with like injuries and stuff, but he's only played a game and a half since, I think, December the 20th. So he shouldn't really be there. Maybe I think Mourinho is just trying to find... We know that that back four is pretty much settled with Regalon and Oriana, the starting fullbacks. Dyer, whatever you think of him, has started 17 out of the 18 Premier League matches. He's the centre-back. And then it's who plays alongside him. And maybe Mourinho has just decided that Alderweireld and Dyer is perhaps too slow. Um maybe gets caught on the turn too much or can't then cover, uh, cover those flying fullbacks. I don't know. But if he can get Roden to where he wants him to be, then I think there's a, there's a very, very good player there. Very good player. So, no, he did really well. I was really pleased with him. And Stephen Bergvine. I, I tweeted after the game and I just got this bizarre tweet back uh, from someone. I'm, I'm not going to name because I don't want to dig him out or anything. But just in general, just saying... Oh, his his attitude and his uh, on the pitch and, and his uh, motivation just isn't good enough. The work rate isn't good enough. I, just, I don't know what player they were watching. I don't know whether that's one of those things where maybe you're just so used to seeing a player in a certain light that you actually can't shake that because I thought Bergman worked incredibly hard. I think, and I've said this so many times, I apologise for being boring, but Spurs look better when Steven Bergman plays. It's no coincidence. The games he hasn't started, Spurs have looked worse in. Uh, Leicester, Wolves, Fulham. Didn't start those three games. Probably Spurs' poorest performances of recent months. Um, he does all the dirty work. He gets into positions. He makes runs. Um, he, he, I mean, it was his shot that was saved that led to the first corner for Aurier's goal. Um, watch the Ondembele goal early in the move, if I remember correctly. He takes a pass with his back uh, to goal, just over the halfway line, really uses his strength, turns, beats his man, plays in Kane, I think plays in Aurier. Then the ball kind of, I think it got intercepted, then came back to Bergvine, who then motored forward, played that, I think he played a 1-2, and then a deft little chip over the top to Ondimbele. So it's an assist for Bergvine, which was brilliant for his confidence. Um, and I think there's one moment as well, where, uh, Hugo Lloris booted a long kick out of um, from his goal. Bergwijn took it so beautifully, kind of on the turn, and then got wiped out as he was running towards the Sheffield United box. And I just think he he absolutely adds more of a thrust to Tottenham's attacking. And it just, like I say, lets Son and Kane do what they do. Um, I really, you know, I will back him to the hill. The goals will come. Uh, Mourinho said that repeatedly, and, and everyone in the club has got really high hopes for Bergwijn. Um He was bought for a reason because they, they'd been tracking him for a while and he had incredible potential. And, you know, he's still he's 22, 23. He's got so much, so much potential. And I really feel he's developed, as in has... I saw someone say, it's his second season now. It's not really, is it? Let's be honest. He came in January, played a few games, picked up an ankle injury. He was out for months, kind of wasn't quite back to full fitness by the for the little tagged on end of the season bit. And now this is kind of really his proper season. And even then, he had muscular problems, which had stopped him training with full intensity, which, weirdly, Marino kind of seemed to either say or completely gone or, or forgot about when I spoke to him about the other day, because he was also ill, missed the Marine match. He only just came back the night before or the day before the uh, Fulham match. 
I think he's a really good player. Really, really, really good player. And I'm he's the reason why you're not seeing Bale and Ali get a lot of minutes, to be honest. He's one of the reasons. Uh, because he's playing very, very well. And, and Mourinho really trusts him as well. So let's wrap that up there on the match. Good stuff. Good match. Uh, much better. Can't probably get too carried away. Because yes, they are the bottom team. Although they'd won back-to-back -back games. So they were getting a bit of confidence. Uh, but much better from Tottenham. And uh, pushing them back in the right direction. In terms of attacking confidence as well, I think. Which was crucial ahead of the... Uh, Obviously, they've got FA Cup next, but Thursday night will be the uh, the big match against Liverpool. Um, so, yeah, that's the match. Let's, let's tie a little bow around that, and that's done for now. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the rest of the transfer window. Obviously, what we in the final nine, ten days or so. Um, we've had a couple of outgoings already in terms of loans. Harvey White and Jack Clark have gone to Portsmouth and Stoke, respectively. Uh, Jack Clark, let's hope this is the one now for him. He... Um, it's very much been developing behind the scenes, learning from the likes of Bale, Son, Kane, people like that. And it was decided, look, let's get him some minutes. Let's get him out there. Um, Stoke changing their formation under Michael O'Neill, looking to become more of a 4-3-3 or at least have that option. Uh, he's come off the bench twice already, Jack Clark, about, I think it's about half an hour each game. Um, certainly the reports I saw, I haven't looked from last night how he... Um, what people have made of him. But I looked on his debut at the weekend and certainly the local paper up there was saying you could really see glimpses of his potential and his really hard work ethic, uh, work rate as well. So that's really good. This will, uh, you know, he's had really two duff loan moves to uh, Leeds and QPR that was weren't very well thought through, really, when you look perhaps with hindsight, but they weren't great. Um, and hopefully this one, this is a, a, a the club, a manager who really feels that they can use him a lot. So down to him now. Needs to bulk up, needs to do what Oliver Skip's doing at Norwich and, you know, build up, bulk up, get a bit of physicality about their play. And, and I think, because often he looks like a teenager coming onto a football pitch, whereas some players look like a guy in their 20s rather than a... Although he is 20 now, I think. I think he's out of his teens. So, yeah, he needs to he needs to just kind of get used to the physicality a bit more. Harvey White, obviously one step down into League One with Portsmouth. That's a really good move for him. Um, you know, there's... There's a link there with Mark Warburton. Um, Mark Warburton, what am I talking about? Kenny Jackett used to be um, at Portsmouth. He used to be involved with Spurs uh, Academy briefly while he was out of out of work. And um, he will know absolutely loads about Harvey White. He will have, uh, yeah, very thoroughly researched that one. And he will play. He, I saw some quotes from him the other day saying that, you know, he's going to come in and play a lot of matches. Um, and it's great for him because, again, another one, it's about just getting used to senior football, getting used to battling against you know football league players. And I've seen some people saying, why isn't he going to the championship and stuff like that? I think it's better for me, for a player like Harvey in his first loan, get in there at a slightly lower level where you know you're going to play every single game. Uh, or not every single game, but you're going to play a lot. Um, and really learn your trade. You know, He came on last night off the bench, which is great for him, his, his football league debut. Um, and it's only can go up from there, honestly. Expect some free kick goals or one or two at least before the end of the season because it's so much quality with those. Um, so, yeah, great move for him. So who else could be going out in these last few days? It all depends. It, this is the weird thing. It all kind of depends on what's happening with the squad at the time. Injuries uh, and things like that. I think, obviously, Danny Rose... There's no secret there that all parties probably would like to, to move on from this absolute mess. Uh, I saw a report that Trav and Spore have been in contact with him about a, a move. As far as I understand, nothing's, you know, that hasn't been, they haven't approached Tottenham. So whether that's a case of looking to get him for free at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, you know, his contract, which obviously he's only got six months left, I don't know. But yeah, <sighs> again. I don't want to parrot too much about what I've said about Danny Rose in the past, but it's an incredible shame that his 13 years has kind of come to this. For him, I'd love him to see him go out and play some football for the last six months or so, um, or whatever it is, because if he is true to his word and he does just see out his contract at Tottenham, I just think that would be really kind of sad and, and just, just a sad waste of a year in his career, really. Um, so keep an eye on that one, obviously. He can talk to foreign clubs now about a free move at the end of the season, but um, I think it's just best for him and all parties, really. Spurs aren't going to get much of a fee, if anything, for him. 
um, just kind of almost get him off the wage bill and, and get him out there playing football again. Um, that's him. Jetson will be an interesting one. See what happens with him now. Um, all expectation, of course, was that he was going to go back to Benfica uh, to play football or, or at least be loaned out again and, and play. Um he was on the bench, you know. He was a he was a surprise one. Seeing him walk off the coach at some on Sunday, um, and you know, and that's that's a couple now. He's been on the bench for, and obviously played I think the full match at Marine as well. So, kind of lends itself. I mean, to be fair to Mourinho, he's been very clear and said I'd be very happy for him to stay. It'd be good for the squad to have uh, the knowledge that we've got him there if we have any injuries and stuff like that. Uh, but also, you know, ultimately it has to be the best or what's what's best for the player. So I'd say if Benfica get a great loan offer for him to go somewhere and it makes financial sense for them to end the deal with Spurs, I think Spurs will just agree to that. But if it means they've already paid for it, Spurs, and if it means, you know, having him around uh, as squad uh, cover when you know there's going to be Games are plenty coming up and potentially players having to isolate. Who knows? Um, you know, he's there. You can debate his quality. You can debate whether he's um, realised or reached his level yet of his potential, of, of how good he could be, of whether he's found a position. But ultimately, it's another body. And especially, I think, Harvey White going to Portsmouth probably suggests that he might stick around. It's not a definite. Like I say, Benfica could get a good offer um, or... What's his name? Uh, what's his name? Jensen Fernandez. I'm actually talking about him. If he says, you know, I think for me it's best to go back, then then it will be uh, then it will be ended that loan. But it's kind of slightly. It feels like it's veering towards him staying at the moment. Uh, obviously, Delhi. We can't get away from Delhi Alley talk. Um, I think it's the same as it's kind of been throughout this window. Really, it has to depend on the squad situation and the kind of offer that comes in. You know, Lo Celso not being back yet from injury and not really there being any clear return date for him. Uh, you know, we'll ask M uh, Mourinho again on, I think, probably Friday's press conference this week, what's the latest with Lacelso? But with Lacelso not there, Ali kind of starts to become almost the first or second backup to really to on Dembele. Um, and if you lose him, as I'll say a bit later, well, I'll just say it now, you're going to run into problems replacing him because it's not as simple as people saying, let's sign Christian Eriksen to replace him. Martin Odegaard um, on loan from Real Madrid. It's not, it's not, or Sabitzer, of his course. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. The squad foreign player limit issues, which I'm not going to go into again. Have a look at anything I've said before. Read articles I've written, whatever, because I really don't want to bore any of the viewers that have, have heard me parrot it so many times. But essentially... Foreign players, Spurs are stuffed. They need to um, they need to sort that situation, not add to it. So if Ali were to go, really, you'd have to bring in another British player, which in the current market is way easier said than done. You know, you know, your your fantasist could say Jack Grealish. No, it doesn't work like that, especially in January. Um, and it would be incredible money. Um, Spurs don't have the money. No clubs. What I'd say about this window as well, if you look at it. No one's buying anyone. I think West Brom have bought a couple, um, like including Snodgrass, purely because they've got a new manager. Man United, I think, are probably the only big club that have brought someone in, but that's Diallo, who was a transfer that was previously agreed. It's just not really happening. You know, I've seen people get frustrated that Spurs aren't doing business, but nobody is. It's because the money's not there, the market's not there. You know, God help Sky Sports News on transfer deadline day, because I think they're going to be talking about... Um, not a lot, really. Um, but yeah, with Ali, you know, as I've said before, there's a lot of people within the club that don't want him to leave permanently, that think this is a blip and that he, um, you know, he just needs to get his mojo back. And of course, there's the, the added thing of if you're purely looking at the time Mourinho spends at a club, um, you know, he has, does have his history suggests, although he said he'd like to stay longer at Spurs, his history suggests roughly three seasons. Um, it would seem daft to lose Delhi or let him go when potentially history suggests in 18 months there'd be a new manager who would love to have Delhi Ali at his disposal. It's, you know, and I do think the Ondin Bele example's there for him as well. I don't, you know, none of us really know what exactly went on behind the scenes, um, especially at half time in that Everton match. 
Um, but I think it'd be crazy to sell him permanently. I think a loan move to somewhere like PSG for six months, if Spurs felt they could cover his absence in the squad, wouldn't be the worst thing. I think he would come back with a lot more confidence. But I also do feel that, you know, you could get into February, you could have a couple of injuries and Delhi starting matches and all it needs is for him to go on a little run of scoring goals, laying on assists and bang. You know, I think he's back in the, back in favour again and, and, and trying to convince Mourinho. So it would have to take a very good offer, I think, from, say, PSG and for Delhi to really kick up a fuss for, for something to happen. Um and for Spurs to have a like-for-like -like replacement in mind, which, you know, unless they did some real reshuffling elsewhere to, to sell a foreign player unexpectedly, if there was an unexpected bid came in, um, it's just, oh, they've got themselves in such a situation. Summer needs to be a big old overhaul. Um, I mean, you look at some of the other foreign players, you've got Paolo Gazaniga. I've said this before, but Spurs were willing to let him go in the summer uh, if a decent bid came in because... He's not playing. I think he's been on the bench once this season. That was against Marine. So for him, he may want to get football, but it needs someone to come in and actually make that offer. It doesn't impact foreign player in terms of the Europa League because he's not even registered in that squad because there's too many. Um, it opens up a second uh, foreign player spot. Very briefly, there's t there's currently one free foreign player spot in the Premier League squad, but there are 25 players in the squad. So Spurs have actually named nine, I think it is nine homegrown players and 16 foreign. So say if Delhi left, you could technically, yes, bring in a foreign player to play in the Premier League, but that would only just exacerbate the problems across the squad for the Europa League and everything. Um, so it doesn't really make much sense purely for the Premier League, although you know, I'm sure there are people out there that would say for the quality of someone some of the names mentioned that you just bite that bullet. But the trouble is, I think Spurs have kind of been doing that a lot. And that's the problem. They keep doing that. And they've created this ridiculous scenario. Um, so Gazaniga, you know, I think if a good offer came in, I don't think they'd stand in the way at all. Um, but it has to come in. And this is the problem. There's not a queue of clubs trying to buy these fringe players. Um, elsewhere, you know, George Marsh, I hope you'd hope he gets a loan. He's playing for the under-23s this season. Had a really good spell at Leighton Orient last season. Really needs to get another loan under his belt. I think his contract's up at the end of this season. Uh, Dylan Markenday, I noticed yesterday, has had his um, extended for another year, which is great. Uh, Talent's a player. If I'm going to be brutally honest, I don't know whether he'll make it through at Spurs, but I do think he could be a really good professional player. I think with Spurs, it's more a case of just so many, so much competition uh, in the positions he plays in. But uh, no, he's, he's very talented, very good little dribbler, a creative player, and, and hopefully he, he progresses. Um, Anthony Georgiou looks like he's heading off to Limassol in um, uh, Cyprus, uh, which is good for him because he's kind of, hasn't not hasn't existed, that's harsh, but hasn't really been playing much football at all in this first uh, half of the season after having a few loan moves in recent years, so... That would be great for him if he gets a good professional career going out there as well. So um, that's kind of mainly an outgoing. Like I say, there can always be a surprise late bid for someone uh, that Spurs would then maybe would start a chain of events where maybe you could let Delhi go and then, then bring in another uh, foreign player. Um, but as I said in the past, Spurs would look pretty much to try and do like for like for anyone to leave. So say... And this is not me saying it will happen, but say Davinson Sanchez, a bid came in for him that everyone agreed to, Spurs would then look to replace him with a defender. So it wouldn't really kind of work with the Delhi angle. Um, sorry, my dog's just deciding to have a drink of water. That's not me um, putting my feet in a, a pool of water or anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I touched on Christian Eriksen. Um, with that situation, as far as I'm aware, it's very much been his representatives have made contact with Spurs. Uh, among a few other Premier League clubs, because he's having a bit of a nightmare there. You know, there's no getting away from it. He's, um, yeah, it just really hasn't worked for him. We, you know, there'll be a touch of irony. You'd think people within Spurs will feel that Ericsson's, you know, representatives were very much, they weren't too keen on him looking to sign a new deal at Spurs, making out that, you know, he could, should be playing at a higher level than Tottenham. They took him to Inter Milan and it's been an absolute mess. Um, hasn't worked for him whatsoever and he hasn't regained his form. 
Um, I think there's some within Spurs that would love Ericsson back. I don't think Mourinho is as sold on it. I think that's a case of him having... He enjoyed, from everything I understand, he enjoyed working with Ericsson during their kind of couple of months together, but he didn't really see the Ericsson that we've seen way in the past. I say way in the past, that's harsh. A couple of years back. Um, so he's only seen the kind of out of form, lack of confidence Ericsson. So for him, I kind of understand why he probably wouldn't want him back. And then, of course, foreign player issues, which we won't go into. So um, I'd, I'd be surprised if that one happened. It would take a lot of manoeuvring and uh, convincing of Mourinho. And also, yeah, some other little kind of bits of the chain would have to happen for that to go to work and go through. Um Defenders, I did a little piece on this the other day, so we could talk about defenders. Everyone always keeps asking about Milan Skriniar, and unfortunately I have to say the same thing each time. Look at what he's doing for Inter. Unlike Ericsson, he's starting every single match. Um, and bearing in mind that Spurs were having talks with him in Italy uh, last summer for a player who was really not in favour, was not playing. And back then there was... 10 million or so um, price difference between the clubs and he's now playing every single match so it's, it doesn't go down you know and that's another thing I just want to say on Delhi and the, and the permanent fee because um, it just reminded me on Skriniar from a businessman's point of view and we know Daniel Levy is a businessman you don't sell low so Delhi right now in the current market and with his lack of form and favour and not playing is not going to be worth a great deal of money, you know, relatively, you know, maybe 25, 30 million, something like that. Deli Alley goes to PSG, does really well. Everything bounces back in football finance once this horrible pandemic and everything's over. Delhi within a year, 18 months could be worth 70, 80 million or more again. Um, as a businessman, especially a guy with three years left in his deal, um, you don't. You just don't sell low. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, and I think this is kind of the reason I went back to that. It's the same with Skriniar. You know, he's. I think he's got two, two and a half years left on his deal. Um, he's playing every week. He's an important player for Inter Milan. That price has not come down. So I can't see that that is even an option. And again, foreign player issues. Um, Kim and Jai, I saw a report about that the other day, as far as I'm aware. That's, you know, good player. Player Spurs have looked at, not someone that they're, unless there's, like I say, a sudden chain of developments in selling a player, not someone they're looking to make a move for this window. Similar with Idar Militao at Real Madrid. I've seen talk of loans and stuff like that. Um, yeah, not a player that I, I'm told not a priority for Spurs, um, was what I understand. So, again, another good player, but... Yeah, not kind of what they're looking at right now. Um, and then you look at strikers. Strikers, there is one. I certainly know Spurs are keeping an eye on. It's it's probably not one that people go, ooh, but it's it's one for the future. It's Carl Joseph, 19-year-old at Wigan. Um, scored five goals, I think, in 12 League One games. This is his first season. He's kind of broken through from the academy. A lot of people watching him. Sheffield United, Celtic Rangers, I think, all looking at him. He, his, his situation is that his contract comes to an end this summer and anyone that wants to sign him then would pay a compensation fee. There's some suggestion that a club might try and do the deal now um, and then obviously like loan him back or something like that. Spurs certainly are interested, but from everything I understand, they're not going to get involved in a tug of war kind of a, a price. Uh, it's got to be It's got to be the right price for them because of two very talented young strikers within their ranks in Troy Parrott and um, Dane Scarlett. Troy, pa Troy Parrott's out of Millwall. He's having uh, an important development loan in terms of everything I said earlier about getting physical, getting used to uh, playing against, you know, get, essentially getting battered by championship defenders, really. Hasn't scored a goal yet. He's had one assist. He was brought down for a penalty. Um, but he is he's starting to play more regularly now. He had an injury at the start of the season. He's now starting to get more games, and he played back-to-back -back games in the in the week. Um, and, yeah, really good for him, that loan. There was a little question marks of whether he might be recorded in January, but 
I think it's good for him, this loan. I think even if it comes away having not scored, you know, Harry Kane on some of his loans did not light up um, in terms of goals scored. It was all about building him up and getting him used to senior football. And with Troy Parrott, that's that's kind of what's happening with him. So he's one, obviously, that, that Spurs are really excited about. And then there's Dane Scarlett, who... Only to say what I've heard, people within the academy are even more excited about Dane Scarlett. Um, only 16, um, was briefly Spurs' youngest player to ever play uh, in a competitive match before Alfie Devine nicked that off him and scored a goal. Um, but, you know, he came on against Ludogorets, looked very bright, almost scored a goal. Mourinho was really happy with him in pre-season as well. And, yeah, those within the club feel that this kid, you know, obviously had a very bad injury. Um, I think it was... A, about a year ago or so, which kept him out for about 10 months. But he's come back, and it's 20 goals this season. And the slight difference with him and Parrot is Parrot, when he first started to play under-23 games, didn't really have too much of an impact and didn't score goals. He did, I think, the last season when he started to play, after he'd had a couple of first-team appearances under his belt. Um, but with Scarlett, first two games, I think it was Chelsea and Brighton from the 23, scored a goal in each. He very much is... As you saw against Ludogorets, not scared of the level, not um, it just very quickly adapts, and there's a lot of excitement about him. I'd be stunned if we, I mean, tiny chance maybe on the bench against Wickham, perhaps. Perhaps you could argue that Alfie Devines deserved to take that one under 18 spot right now. But like I say, 20 goals this season, 18 for the under 18s and two for the under 23s. Um, in the FA Youth Cup, Spurs were 2 0 down to Newport. And then it became the Dane Scarlet show. It's called five goals. The Spurs turned it around and won 6-2. But I'd be surprised if he's not involved in preseason again next year. And then maybe Spurs start to look to either get him involved or give him a loan. But he's, it's wonderful. I hate it. When, when young players get a really bad injury, it really can just define the rest of their, their career. Anyone that's read my feature, my interviews and stuff with um, uh, Terry Dixon, you know, it was such a big young thing at Spurs and then had two nightmare knee injuries. Um, so for Dane Scarlett to have had that happen to him and come back, fingers crossed, because it's such a volatile uh, pathway from the academy to, to the top level. Uh, but fingers crossed he can go on to be um, someone special because there's been a lot of players that have been play, people have been excited about, but circumstances, injuries, um, too many players ahead of them in the team hasn't led to them kind of fulfilling that. Um, so hopefully he makes it. But staying on strikers, let's talk about Danny Ings. A lot of stuff about Danny Ings recently. Um, as I said way back in videos in the summer, Danny Ings was a player Spurs really interested in, really kind of considered him as a as a potential summer uh, purchase. But obviously, price tag was crazy for Southampton. Not crazy. It was it was some, um, tantamount to what he was worth. Um, but he also would need a lot of convincing to come. Um, we're now in a slightly different situation where there's a, a chance he might not sign a new contract at Southampton. Ralph, uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph, Ralph, Ralph Hasenhutl, if I can speak today, has um, hinted that if he doesn't sign a new contract it comes to the summer, with a year left in his deal, they might have to accept uh, a very good offer for him, or a good offer. And we know this is exactly what Spurs did with Southampton Hoybier. They waited for that final year, and then they got him for a very good price. Um I don't think, I mean, there has been talk of a contract where he has a release clause as well. My only thing is I don't think the spectre of Harry Kane has gone anywhere. I don't think that changes for Danny Ings. If I was Danny Ings, and I understand this was the case, I'd be very wary about it. Because, I mean, Carlos Vinicius was a guy that Mourinho really wanted and Spurs went for him in the end. Although Mourinho, as I understand, is a big Ings fan as well. So... Vinicius has come in, and I saw a little interview he did with ESPN Brazil the other day, saying, look, I'm not going to get a lot of minutes. I know that. Whether it's three minutes, five minutes, or 90, I've just got to grab whatever chance I get. And I think seeing, if Danny Ings sees stuff like that, it only further reinforces the fact that if you're coming in, Harry Kane is so good, he's so dominant, he's so important, that you're not going to get a lot of minutes. I hear people say, and I understand it, that, oh, Mourinho might switch to two up front, which he has very much said um, at the start of this season when Vinicius came in. But it hasn't happened for Vinicius. That hasn't been a, a, a thing for him. So I think a lot of it comes down to Son and Kane's partnership. Yes, you could argue you could put Son out to the left and play with the front two. 
However, I think you're doing Son a disservice there. I think Son as purely as a left winger, you're not getting the max out of him. I think have Son as a guy who can come in from the left and kind of partner up with Kane, and you're getting the Son that you're getting this season, which is a phenomenal um, Son Hoon Min. So I, I still don't see even Danny Ings coming in. Um, and then you've got all the other side of things of his injury history, and he'll be, I think he turns 29 in the summer in July. So it's not really a Spurs signing either, it's especially if the price, uh, he did sign a contract and he had a, a release clause that was was quite high. Um, or, or the valuation they put on him in the summer isn't great. I, I If I were Danny Ings, I'd probably go somewhere where you're going to play week in, week out, and not have to hope you get three, five or 90 minutes. Um, and on Vinicius, it's all down to Vinicius now. If you look at it on the surface of things, six goals, three assists in 11 appearances, very good. Obviously, you've got to take into account three of those are against a team in the eighth tier um, of English football in, in Marine. Uh, but it is down to him to kind of bang on that door with any chances he gets and essentially say to Mourinho, look, try me up front with Harry Kane. Try it. See what happens. Even if it's just giving me half an hour at the end of games and I'm scoring goals. And if you find that he starts to score goals in the Premier League, then I think Spurs look at that £38 million to make his deal permanent and think, are we actually going to get anyone better for that price? Or is he happy to be here, happy to get the minutes he does, and is actually very dangerous and scores goals when he, he can? You know, the likelihood, the evidence of the past suggests that we're going to get a period of this season where Harry Kane will be injured and will miss a certain run of games. And that is when Vinicius comes in and does exactly what Spurs have bought him for. And if he can do that, I think a bit like Lo did, I think he then essentially makes Spurs do that deal, purely because you've got a tried, tested person that you know can do the job. Um, so yeah, keep an eye, uh, we'll keep an eye on the Vinicius situation and, and fingers crossed, because he comes across as a lovely guy. He's had a tough few years um, and he's he's learning bits and bits of English uh, with Lucas Moura helping him um, and, and a tutor as well. So he'll get there. He will. So uh, looking ahead, we've got Wickham. Wickham on Monday night, uh, which hopefully I'll be going to if I get accreditation comes through, which Wickham are having their problems. You know, bottom of the championship, um, COVID outbreak. Likelihood they could be playing a very young, weak team on Monday night because obviously in the FA Cup, there's more of a, a push to get the games played if you've got those 14 players available. So you'd imagine that Mourinho could then shake it up and you could have Bale Delhi, maybe Jensen and give minutes of Vinicius as we've just spoken about, give them all minutes because um, then you've got the double whammy of Liverpool on a Thursday night and a trip to Brighton which is not an easy game at all, Brighton have, have been playing some very good football this season under Graham Potter so um, you know, two huge games so if you can give those players, yes, I know it's eight days between um, Sheffield United and, and uh, Wickham but give them a little bit extra extra rest or or even prepare one team in training for um, Wickham and prepare another for um, Liverpool and I think that kind of benefits everyone but we'll see, I, I'd imagine he'll mix it up it's, it's, Mourinho doesn't really go with that that way of doing it um, also I wanted to very briefly, before I go, mention the Son documentary, have a little watch, I've watched it on Amazon Sonsational, it was form, uh, filmed a little while back like 2019, I think 2018 crossover into 2019 um it's all right. It's all right. I think it's adapted from a Korean one. Um, it's a very interesting insight into Son's life. Um, I must admit, I kind of slightly feel sad for him and, and what he does in his kind of spare time and stuff. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but watch it. It's good. And it'll only reinforce your love of Son. You know, Son is such a wonderful guy, such a lovely guy. I'm very fortunate to interview him on a few occasions. And, and he's exactly as you'd imagine. He's fantastic, and I think that only grows with the documentary. Um, and like I say, you do just feel a little bit sorry for him, I'd say, in a, in a in more than a few moments. But uh, I'll leave that for you to, to watch. Uh, so there you go. Right, I'm going to head off, hopefully do another one of these if I can, after maybe after Wickham, we'll see. But um, yeah, as always, stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves, and uh, I shall talk to you soon. Bye.